If you followed my PhD journey, starting in 2013 and finishing in December 2018, then you'll have seen what I have been studying. You've seen how I have studied it. But I want to, in this video, definitively set out what I found and what ended up going in my thesis. And thanks to Dashlane for sponsoring this video. It's going to go into some detail, so to stop people from feeling lost, I've broken it down into sections. Let's start with some background. So my PhD was about the Earth's atmosphere. Like ogres, like onions, the atmosphere is divided into layers. layers. From the bottom up, you have the troposphere, the stratosphere, the mesosphere, and the thermosphere. These layers are most commonly defined by their temperature profile, how temperature changes as you go higher up. In the troposphere, the temperature gets colder the higher you go. If you've ever been up a mountain, you'll have felt this effect. However, once you go past about 10 kilometers above the surface, the temperature stays the same and then actually increases with altitude. This happens until you hit about 50 kilometers up, at which point the temperature starts to decrease with altitude again. This region is called the stratosphere and it behaves very differently to our layer of the atmosphere the troposphere. The largest feature of the stratosphere is the polar vortex, a circulation of fast-moving air over a thousand kilometers across, with wind speeds of over 200 kilometers per hour, that forms every year in the winter over the Arctic. My PhD was about how these two layers interact with one another, in particular during big violent events called sudden stratospheric warmings. A sudden stratospheric warming occurs when the polar vortex breaks apart, either because it split in two or because it moves moved too far south. These events are called warmings because when the vortex breaks apart, air from further south piles into the stratospheric arctic and squishes it down. This squishing, or more properly, adiabatic descent, results in increases in temperatures of up to 70 or even 80 degrees celsius in the stratosphere over just a couple of days. And we've known since about the year 2000 that when sudden stratospheric warmings happen, the weather in the troposphere is affected for up to two months. Storms going across the Atlantic track further south than normal, and there's an increased chance of extreme cold in the mid-latitudes. This happens because the primary mode of variability in the stratosphere is the strength of the polar vortex, while the primary mode of variability in the troposphere is the location of the jet stream, the fast-moving river of air that divides cold arctic air from warmer mid-latitude air. And these two modes of variability are coupled together, which we can describe mathematically by an arctic oscillation index, which is just a number which can be defined at any height above the surface. If the AO index is positive, the polar vortex is strong and the jet stream is relatively straight and far north. If the AO index is negative, then the vortex is weak and the jet stream is wavy and further south. In the aftermath of sudden stratospheric warmings, we see descending negative AO index anomalies, the influence of the sudden warming creeping towards the surface and staying there. So a vortex breaking apart results in a very wavy jet stream, which sits further south. We know that this happens, but we don't know how this happens. My PhD was about proposing a quantitative mechanism for this descending influence. And in order to explain exactly how I did that, I first need to give you two more pieces of specific background information. The Arctic Oscillation Index is a result of a complex statistical process called Principal Component Analysis, or PCA. You don't need to understand how this works, but the end result is important. When applied to surface pressures over the Northern Hemisphere over a couple of years of data, PCA defines a pattern over the Earth. This pattern explains where the majority of variability in surface pressure takes place. For example, it shows that if pressure over the Arctic is relatively high, the pressure over the North Atlantic is relatively low, a bit like a seesaw. This is the Arctic Oscillation pattern, and the AO index is the number that tells you if the seesaw has one end up or the other. In terms of the pattern, whether the Arctic pressure is high, and so Atlantic pressure is low, or if the Arctic pressure is low and the Atlantic pressure high. The first step in my PhD was simplifying how we represent these variations in surface pressure. For reasons that will become clear in a second, I was specifically interested in the pressure over the Arctic. So I defined a new pressure index, designed to be equivalent to the AO index. It was designed to be simple to make, 
You just average the pressure over the area north of the 65 north latitude line and then subtract the long running average to produce a pressure anomaly over the Arctic. But is this equivalent to the AO index? Well, if you compare the Arctic oscillation pattern to where my index is calculated, you see that my index is defined over the same area as the primary blob of the AO pattern. And because the AO is a seesaw pattern, if you know whether one side of the seesaw is up or down, you know if the other side is down or up. So my index contains the same information as the AO index, but in a simpler way. And this is something which I demonstrated statistically. So I defined a new index to represent the principal mode of variability of air pressure. But why was that important to do? Well, I defined the index in such a way that I could easily derive equations that govern how it varied in response to changes in the rest of the atmosphere. So remember what I was trying to do? I was trying to show how the strength of the polar vortex varying could change the position of the jet stream in the troposphere. If I could derive a set of equations which showed how the pressure index in the troposphere varied in response to changes in the stratosphere, then I will have achieved that. You can think of my index as like an imaginary cylinder of air surrounding and above the Arctic. The pressure anomaly in a particular slice of this cylinder has the same information in it as the complex PCA created AO index. But while that index has lots of things that influence how it changes in time, my pressure index has just two things. The mass of air that goes through the cylinder's walls above the slice, and the mass of air that moves vertically through the slice. If air moves horizontally into the cylinder above, then there will be more mass on top of the slice of cylinder, which will increase the pressure on it. Likewise, if air moves vertically up through the cylinder, then the pressure on the slice will also increase. What I needed to do then was derive two equations, one that describes the air mass that moves horizontally into the cylinder, and one that describes the mass that moves vertically in the cylinder. These are those two equations, and they were the next important thing I did in my PhD. If you want details of how they're derived, then read my thesis, link in the description. For this video, I need to explain the most important variable in these equations, psi, the stream function. A stream function is a way that we can mathematically describe a fluid flow. The atmosphere behaves like a fluid on a rotating sphere, and so we can define a stream function for the atmosphere. A stream function is a scalar field, meaning that it has a single value at every point in the atmosphere. The speed that the atmosphere flows in the east to west and north to south directions, otherwise known as wind, is calculated by looking at how much the stream function varies in the north to south and east to west directions, respectively. You can also calculate the temperature of the atmosphere at a point by looking at how much the stream function changes as you get higher in the atmosphere. So by calculating the gradient of one field, the stream function, you get information about multiple fields, wind and temperature. I used a stream function to calculate the air mass moving into and within the imaginary cylinder of air around the Arctic via these two equations. But I've only told you what the stream function is, not how you calculate it. And that's really a video all on its own. But basically, you use a variable called potential vorticity, or PV for short, which might sound familiar to long-term viewers. PV is another scalar variable that's rich in information about the state of the atmosphere. It's not a physical thing that you can see or feel, but constructed from how air rotates and how temperature changes with height. Via a process called inversion, you can take a PV distribution and get a stream function from it. The PV can be in just one part of the atmosphere, and yet the stream function you get by inverting it is defined everywhere. So the stream function associated with a PV distribution in just one area encodes information about how that area influences the rest of the atmosphere. This has been a few conceptual leaps one after the other, so just to recap, PV is a variable in the atmosphere, which you invert to get a stream function, which describes how the atmosphere behaves. The stream function can be used to calculate how air mass gets moved around in the Arctic, and those mass fluxes used to calculate changes in my pressure index. PV calculates a stream function, which calculates mass fluxes, which calculates changes in the pressure index, which tells us whether the surface atmospheric seesaw is up or down. If I could show that changes in the PV distribution in the stratosphere 
caused changes in the pressure index at the surface, then I will have achieved my goal. But I found something a bit different, and not what I expected. You can add together the stream functions calculated from inverting different PV distributions in different places in isolation to get a total stream function. If you've studied electrostatics, this will sound familiar. It's just like the superposition of charges. And remember that PV encodes information about the area of the atmosphere it's defined in, transmitted by the stream function to the whole atmosphere. So if you invert the PV in the stratosphere on its own, you will get a stream function which tells you how the stratosphere influences the rest of the atmosphere. I could define a stream function, psi s, which only has stratospheric information in it. It's calculated by inverting stratospheric PV only, and then use this stream function in my horizontal and vertical mass flux equations to see how the stratosphere influences the pressure index in the troposphere. And I could equally define a stream function psi t, which is calculated by inverting PV from the troposphere on its own, and then use that in my mass flux equations. Combining the two stream functions together produces the total stream function, and so the total horizontal and vertical mass flux. However, by considering the stream functions separately, you can isolate how much horizontal and how much vertical mass flux is forced by changes in the stratosphere, and how much is forced by changes in the troposphere. My theory was that in the aftermath of sudden stratospheric warmings, the vortex splitting apart, that the stratosphere had a strong influence on the troposphere, communicated via mass fluxes induced by changes in the stratospheric PV distribution. Man, it literally took this entire video up until that point to be able to say that sentence and have you understand what it means. I could test my theory by calculating the total mass fluxes moving into and within the imaginary arctic cylinder of air via my equations, and then comparing that to the mass fluxes seen in observations. If the total mass flux predicted by my equations matched those seen in observations, then that would verify that my equations were correct. And if that was the case, the relative sizes of the two contributions, from the stratosphere and from the troposphere, will tell me if the stratosphere has a significant influence on the troposphere. So... was I right? This is an example time series of my pressure index as seen in observations. The horizontal axis is time, and the vertical axis is height above the ground. You see descending positive and negative pressure anomalies over the Arctic. Now compare this to what I calculated using my equations. At first glance, they don't appear very similar, but you start to see similarities between the two. This large negative feature followed by an ascending positive anomaly. This large positive anomaly encompassing a negative anomaly, all of which are approximately the right magnitude. If you do the stats, the two time series, from observations and calculated by equations, are reasonably close to one another for the past 40 years of data. They correlate moderately. I'll spare you the exact details of why this doesn't work perfectly, but the basic reason is that you're trying to sum up lots of things which are positive and negative to try and make something which is very nearly zero. And that's open to a lot of errors, especially when using coarse resolution data. If you're willing to accept that these two are close enough to one another, then you can examine the contributions from the stratosphere on its own and from the troposphere on its own. Clearly, the influence of the stratosphere doesn't really get past the tropopause, the barrier between the troposphere and the stratosphere. But this is cool. Eagle-eyed viewers will have noticed that something is missing. Take another look at these two equations for the horizontal and vertical mass flux. The vertical mass flux equation is a linear function of the stream function used, meaning that the stream function never gets multiplied by itself. A bunch of stuff happens to it, but it only appears once. The horizontal mass flux equation, however, isn't linear. It has a psi times a psi, here. It's a non-linear equation in psi. That means that while you can add together the vertical mass flux contribution from the stratosphere and the vertical mass flux contribution from the troposphere to get a total, you can't do that for the horizontal mass flux. To get the total contribution, you add up the contributions from the stratosphere and the troposphere, and then add an interference term, which has both stratospheric and tropospheric information in it. 
So just to reiterate, because this equation is non-linear, when combining contributions from two different stream functions, you have to add an interference term to the sum, representing the interaction of those two stream functions. If you add that interference term to the stratospheric influence, represented using psi s star, then you see the influence of the stratosphere penetrating into the troposphere. Or in other words, the non-linear interaction of stratospheric and tropospheric information allows for changes in the stratosphere to affect the surface. And while this is just one example time series, the overall statistics for the 40 years of data back up this conclusion. So speaking mathematically, I demonstrated that the non-linear interaction of stratospheric and tropospheric information substantially forced arctic pressure tendencies in the troposphere, which is equivalent to saying that they substantially forced the AO index in the troposphere, or surface weather. And that's not something which we'd known before, and it was something which was only possible to learn because of the entire framework that I'd constructed in my thesis, from the pressure index to the mass flux equation. I realise that this video is a relatively deep dive with lots of new concepts and not very much time, so in case you got lost along the way, let me rephrase what I learned in my PhD without referencing any of the maths. I learned that the stratosphere, that's the next layer up of the atmosphere, can influence the troposphere, our layer of the atmosphere, including weather at the surface, but not directly. Instead, the stratosphere influences surface weather by the way that it communicates with the troposphere. Or, if you like, that the stratosphere can influence the surface weather, but if, and only if, the troposphere is in the right configuration to receive that influence. And this is a relationship which is most noticeable in the aftermath of big events like sudden stratospheric warmings, but it holds generally. And that non-linear relationship, the conversation that goes on between the stratosphere and the troposphere, is something that we didn't quantitatively know until my PhD. This video, as long as it is, is still only a brief overview of what I did in my PhD, and it doesn't even include all the results from my thesis. So if you'd like to learn more about what I did and read it yourself, then I'd at least recommend giving the background chapter a read, then you can do so on my website. I have a website, by the way. My website is actually protected by this video sponsor, Dashlane. I started using Dashlane a couple of weeks ago on my phone and on my computer and my laptop, and honestly, I have nothing but positive things to say about it. Dashlane is a service that keeps track of your passwords behind patented security software so that only you, not even they, have access to your encrypted data. But more than that, it alerts you if you reuse passwords, which I had about 150 times, and can generate and automatically store strong passwords for you. So since starting to use the service a couple of weeks ago, every single one of my online accounts has become safer. And given that the app on your phone actually autofills forms out for you as long as you've got your master password, it makes life easier too. Frankly, for the amount of my life that I spend online, I think it's worth spending a little bit of money a month to make sure that my information from my social media accounts, to my YouTube channel, to my bank details are safe. And if you think so too, then go to dashlane.com forward slash Simon Clark. And if you'd like to upgrade to premium, then the first 200 people to use the promo code Simon Clark will get 10% off. Thank you for watching the video. I hope that you learned a few things and that I didn't make this either too simple or too complicated. Though knowing me, I probably managed to do both. If you'd like to see the tropospheric effect of a sudden stratospheric warming, then go and check out the video I made on the recent cold snap across North America. And if you haven't seen my PhD vlogs, then go watch them. Thank you very much for watching the video and I'll see you in the next one.